Welcome to Strength in Leos. What is up, everybody? It's Evan back with Strength in Leos. I hope. Everybody's having an amazing day today, and thank you for joining me on the podcast. Uh, Thank you for everybody who's new to the podcast and also people who have been listening before. I really appreciate your listens and your support and really all the great stuff that you guys contribute to the hobby and especially this podcast. And I really want to give a really special shout out to those overseas listening to the podcast. I've seen a really big jump in numbers through the data that we've been collecting through the podcast and listen. So really thank you to those overseas listening to the podcast and those who aren't in the U.S. And it's really awesome to see the support from breeders around the world really coming together for just the common passion of leopard geckos and breeding and through the reptile hobby. It's really great to see that we have support not just in the U.S. but also from really great breeders who are doing great stuff with morphs, even just pure species overseas and really creating a great environment for the hobby and just really expanding our hobby. So for this episode, we're back for episode 15 on the podcast and we have Seth Hoffpower of Huff's Herbs who has been on the podcast plenty of times now. Seth is an amazing guy who's been great with Leo's, also AFTs. He's a multi-species dude who's killing it in both areas. And we have a podcast that's a really special podcast where we talk about AFTs, but also an issue that Seth has been going through uh, with the AFT. So make sure you go ahead and listen to the full episode. Tons of great stuff. And hopefully you guys are able to learn everything uh, about what we talked about in the podcast. Also going back to support, I want to give a big shout out to Josiah, who's part of our Patreon crew. Thanks, Josiah, for being part of the Patreon crew and really helping us out and supporting the podcast. Another note about Patreon, if you guys listened to our last episode with Shane, I mentioned that Patreon will be free for the months of September and October coming up soon. So if you guys aren't on our Patreon, just check it out uh, once September 1st hits. It'll be free, no charge to anyone for uh, the beginning tiers of Patreon where you're able to come and get some really exclusive, cool behind the scenes things. We do monthly Patreon hangouts. Uh, you get special deals on t-shirts and Strength and Leo's merch. It's just a good way to really just grow the hobby, really connect with you guys and listeners of the podcast. So if you guys are really interested in that for the months of September and October, Patreon will be free. So you can go ahead and check that out at patreon.com slash strength and Leo. And before we go on, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. The Blessed Gecko over the last five years has acquired an incredible variety of geckos from some of the top genetics available. In the past, they have maintained all animals within their own collection as holdbacks as they have taken time to observe genetic pairings dispositions, sizes, coloration, patterning, and etc. Go check them out on Facebook and Instagram, and of course, go check out what they have available for sale. Impeccable Gecko is a small to mid-sized, family-operated, hobbyist breeder operation. They specialize in leopard geckos with high-quality genetics. At Impeccable Gecko, integrity and animal welfare is above all else. Miles Schwartz works with some awesome morphs and lines that are not only high-quality, but also fairly rare in the hobby. Go check out their social media and awesome YouTube channel. John Scarborough of Gecko Boar Reptiles has kept and bred more than 80 species of reptiles and his focus has turned to specializing within the genus Eublepharis. He has worked hard to pioneer some of the most cutting edge leopard geckos while maintaining genetic purity and honesty. Go check out their website for their most up to date availability and don't forget to follow all of their social media. Suburban Geckos is operated by Chris Charlton. Chris's passion and enjoyment for herpticulture and more specifically leopard geckos drove the desire to take his hobby to the next level. Suburban Geckos treats every animal with the utmost care and respect and cut no corners when it comes to the health and integrity of their geckos. Suburban Geckos is a strong supporter of the Strength Leos podcast, so follow them on social media and check out what they have available for sale. Grove Geckos is a family-owned and oriented medium-scale leopard gecko business. Lance Musgrove is a hobbyist breeder with the goal of producing healthy, visually stunning, and refined genetics for their geckos. They can be found online at grovegeckos.com or on social media like Facebook and Instagram. Give them a follow and reach out to Lance at any time. Spotty Tail Geckos is a small hobbyist breeder that focuses on quality genetics and maintaining excellent husbandry. Andy got started in the hobby when his daughter wanted a pet leopard gecko. He immediately fell in love with the animals and the hobby. Andy started breeding his first leopard geckos in 2015. To this day, he keeps a very small collection sourced from top tier breeders. We have an awesome guest back on the podcast. You guys know this dude. He's amazing. Been on the podcast plenty of times now. You guys already know his his face and name. Uh, Seth, welcome back to the podcast. What's up, Evan? Glad to be back, man. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, 
C- couldn't thank you more for for letting me uh, jump in, kind of last minute like this to get something out there. Um, no problem. Yeah, that's what the podcast is all about. I'm glad that you reached out. You have an amazing platform already, so I'm extremely humbled that you reached out to, even to me to get this on the podcast and to get it to as many people um, to hear a little bit about what this episode is going to be about today. So you kind of reached out to me um, saying like, dude, I have this urgent thing I want to talk to you about. I think we should get it out on the podcast. And we had a phone call and everything. So tell everybody listening today um, why you came in um, and on the podcast today. So yeah, I've had something come up in my collection that uh, that needs some, some attention to to you know from the hobby from everybody um i think it's something that uh it may have been overlooked or or possibly ignored in the past and by by others and it's something that i i've i've figured out is something definitely worth attention um and basically what i'm gonna do is i i wrote up a big long post with my books out and and all my records and everything to make sure i had everything super accurate so um, I'm going to start by just reading the post that I made just in case there's anybody that hasn't seen it or for, for those of you, those of your listeners that haven't seen it, cause I'm sure there's plenty that haven't. Um, I just put this out the other day. Uh, I, I like I said, I, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, so obviously everybody knows I keep, you know, leopard geckos and fat tail geckos and fat tail geckos are m- m- probably the bigger part of my collection at this point. So. Um, I wrote this up. So the purpose of this post is to shed light on observations that I've made in a certain line of AFTs in my personal collection. I'm going to start from the very beginning and do my very best to explain what I'm dealing with. To be clear, none of the symptoms explained in the following were observed in any animals that I recalled and refunded. These were all my own observations. My original trio of AFTs were acquired as juveniles in 2015. The group consisted of two whiteout head Oreo sisters and a striped head Oreo male. I raised them up to correct breeding age and size and made my first attempt at hatching babies in, in late 2016. I failed to produce anything that year due to my lack of experience and knowledge at the time. In 2017, I paired the same two females with slightly better success. I produced a total of six fat tail hatchlings, three from each pairing. One of those babies failed to thrive and passed away. Towards the end of the 2017 laying season, one of my original females began displaying symptoms that seemed neurological. She developed a head tilt similar to what some ES geckos display. Her aim was not affected, and she continued to eat and shed without any issues. My veterinarian considered all possible causes, but could not diagnose any known ailment. So we took a wait-and-see approach with her condition. The severity of her tilt gradually improved, but she has never returned to normal equilibrium. As a precaution, I retired her as a family pet along with her two offspring. They are still in my collection and the offspring still don't show any issues at all. I assumed it to be an isolated issue since there wasn't any info out there referring to anything similar that I could find. The only thing that made sense was possible metabolic issues, a stroke or something of that nature. The original sister had never shown any, had and has still never shown any symptoms. So I continued to use her as a breeder and kept near, nearly all of her offspring as future breeders. In 2018, I also purchased a juvenile whiteout Oreo female directly from the breeder that my original lineage traces back to. This gecko was paired in 2019 and produced two healthy offspring, both of which were kept with the intention of using as breeders. In late 2019, a major fo- after following a major photo shoot, she developed a significant issue with her aim. I took her to the vet with the same dead end results. I found her a very loving forever home with a previous customer that I knew would be perfect for her special needs. At this point, I still hadn't tied anything to the original symptoms observed in my first female. I didn't consider the animals to be directly related as my trio was several generations removed from the breeder I purchased the white out Oreo from. Additionally, they were displaying entirely different symptoms. One had a head tilt and one had really, really off aim. Um, Again, however, I took the precautions of not breeding this gecko's offspring. They were both adopted out as pets with full disclosure about the issues observed in the mother. Now fast forward to the beginning of this season, 2021. I had about a dozen gorgeous holdback whiteouts from the original healthy female, healthy female, all ready to breed. 
having sold a handful of perfectly healthy whiteouts the previous season from these a couple of these offspring from the healthy female i was really getting excited about where my group of animals were in quality people had started showing interest in the project then the unthinkable happened i observed the faintest tilt in one of my females that i produced and had just started breeding the previous year she is one of many daughters produced from the healthy unaffected original female my heart completely dropped when i realized what i was seeing i continued to closely observe her over the next several weeks not only did her head tilt become slightly more noticeable but her aim also started to falter she's now displaying a combination of the two separate symptoms that i've observed once i was positive of her condition i began contemplating how to properly handle the situation it's hard to determine exactly what has triggered the symptoms that i've observed but the fact that there that this third animal traces directly back to the sister of the first affected animal leads me to suspect something lying dormant in this line of geckos all three happened during egg production so perhaps there is some issue that's being triggered during high metabolic demand all three were also exposed to high to bright flash photo shoot prior to observing symptoms that's one possibility that keeps running through my mind but even if this is some type of retinal damage this it's not being observed in any of the other dozens of geckos that were photographed in the same conditions in any case i feel the responsibility to do what i can in scrapping this line of whiteouts altogether i have already reached out to all the customers that have purchased juvenile whiteouts from this group over the last year none of which were old enough to be bred yet most customers were very understanding and appreciative of my honesty a few were accepting of my offer for a full refund on the animals they had purchased from me and a few seemed to be a little disgruntled about the whole situation which is entirely understandable while i may receive some criticism about not making the decision much sooner hindsight's always 2020. i know in my heart that i'm doing the right thing in this situation with the information i have now i could have stayed quiet about this and crossed my fingers that it wouldn't be passed on like many others likely have but that's not how i roll these animals are beautiful peaceful creatures that deserve our utmost respect i would like to encourage anybody to dm me with questions about this and then i went on to say that we were going to be on this podcast to do this i didn't have too many people reach out um and that's about it evan that's that's the gist of it well like i told you before seth it was super uh well written i'm glad that you went out and it just kind of shows your integrity and your character you have developed this uh you know this amazing line of white out oreos and you have amazing animals from you know bold striped leopard geckos to nice AML AFTs to so many other things you do. And because of that, you've had an amazing reputation over the years of what you've done. And this kind of just solidifies that reputation that you, you know, developed in the hobby and you continue to have today writing this. So appreciate you for that. Um, with all the issues going on, what are some speculations that you have? I know you kind of talked about it in your essay, but what causes do you really think that could have caused this or you may have seen in animals coming from this line or anything else regarding it, kind of the situation it's it's really hard to say evan i mean first of all i want to emphasize that this seems to really be an isolated issue to uh, only a certain line or couple lines of of whiteouts like there's hundreds of thousands of whiteouts out there i mean if you especially if you think about all the huge collections in asia and everything and so far we've been able to track since i've come out with this and we've done a little bit more research and reached out to a lot of bigger breeders. We've been able to track down like a dozen animals that have a significant issue that is definitely could be, you know, and some of them are traced back to a similar lineage. You know, like I said, uh, there's several different branches, but um, it's definitely something that I, I feel like it, it can't be ignored. It, it needs to be a, it, it's not something I want everybody scared of because like I said, there's so many whiteouts out there. I have so many whiteouts in my collection that are from different lines that right. have never shown any issues at all. I think I got very unlucky with the group of animals I started with. And however, I am pretty lucky in the fact that I've been hoarding them for a long time and have just, you know, only a few out there that I had to track down and, and gather up. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that, that I really don't, feel like this is something that's widespread in whiteouts at all. I feel like it's very isolated. Um, as far as my speculation of what causes it, I, it's really hard to say, Evan, because the thing about it is, and what makes it really difficult to like, you know, some people 
some of the people that called, you know, obviously they didn't want to get rid of the beautiful animals they had. And they were like, well, what if we, you know, try to outcross this, you know, we can help you work, work around it. And the problem with that option with this, Evan, is it's not like, it's nothing similar to like Enigma or white, or white and yellow syndrome or anything like that, because you, there's no symptoms at, at hatch at all. All this, all, almost all of the animals that we have observations of all the animals I have observations of were like two years old whenever they first showed symptoms. Right. Like perfectly healthy chow hounds killing it, you know, for two years. And then either uh, uh, all of them were bred. All the ones that I have were bred. Um, one of the ones that I, I've talked to that I know is for sure from the same line. Um, that was after the big ice storm we had down here in Texas. And he, you know, he, he just kind of assumed that what he was seeing in her was from that. And then whenever he saw my post, he reached out to me and we figured out that it is actually from the same lineage. Um, but that's kind of, it's really hard to say. And it's hard, it's hard to track exactly because it seems like different stressors are causing it. So it's hard to say exactly right. what it is that's happening. Um, one breeder had a had a theory that maybe there's some kind of you know blood vessels bursting in in the brain or something, in that and that that certain line is more genetically predisposed to like a little mini stroke kind of you know. Um, Got it. That's yeah. one possibility. Um, I I honestly don't know. I wish I wish I did know, because I think if we knew, then we could maybe figure out how to work around it, solve but it. yeah, it's right at the end of the day. I mean, it's a beautiful line of white out Oreos, but there's plenty of other gorgeous lines of white out Oreos out there that people are working with, you know? So yeah, it, it's not, I have another line that I've started working with a couple of years ago. I haven't been, I haven't refined it as much as this line, but it's, you know, going to be equally awesome in a few years. You know, it's just a matter of, of getting, getting the right pairings made. Um, so yeah. in my honest opinion, from what I've seen, I don't feel like it's worth trying to work around because the main factor of you can't see it at hatch. That's the, I mean, that's such a big factor, you know, it's not something that you can say, yeah. okay, this female's carrying it. Um, you, you might hatch two seasons from her and then third season realize, um, that something's off with her, you know, All right. Um, or like the other females, two years later, then they start developing those issues. Exactly. You thought they were all perfect, you know, at hatch. Well, so. yeah, that's the thing. Um, I mean, it's you just you just can't tell until until it's there. And then, like like I said, whenever this one happened this year, it it all came together for me right away because she's because she's showing a sim a combination of the symptoms that I saw in the other two geckos years apart from, you know, not directly related. When this gecko showed a combination of those symptoms, I was like, whoa, I put the brakes on everything, you know. I, I'm sure right. everybody's, some people may have noticed I've been pretty inactive lately on social media, and that's pretty much why, because I've been totally stressed out with this and dealing with this, and, you know, June was just a crazy month for me dealing with this, and I, it's, it's, it's been a roller coaster for sure. I'll say that. Right. Yeah. And even just from your perspective, you kind of had a really hard decision to make. You know, you put a lot of work and effort into this line and tons of babies that babies you've already sold to people, you know, that you had to give, you made the decision to give refunds for, but um, you had kind of two decisions to just, well, three, you could have just, you know, shut up, kept your mouth closed and kept solding things off and you could have retired those females, kept breeding them, did whatever you could have, you know, sold everything off and never told anybody and then kind of the decision you did make which was to hold everything off and then give refunds so what kind of was your thought process to end up doing that it's not a thing that a lot of people we see things with like enigma or like some lines of white and yellows have one yellow syndrome or going back to like the lemon fall frost fiasco where some people um and some breeders didn't even get compensation for animals that um they bought from other breeders and that rose a lot of issues. So why did you decide to go the route that you went with, you know, stopping everything and then giving everybody refunds as a breeder? Well, I guess at the end of the day, Evan, I'm, I'm in this for the, for the long game. Like I don't plan on going anywhere. We've been messing with geckos for about six years seriously now. And, uh, I, I'm going to be here for a while. And I didn't want to try to, 
you know, like you said, I had several options. I could have just retired everything I had in my possession and hoped and prayed that the ones that I had out there already, which was only a handful, didn't have it. And honestly, the chances that they don't have it are pretty good with the with the odds that we're seeing numbers wise. You know what I mean? Um, uh, of the few that are showing up with it, but. It, it wasn't worth the risk for me because I don't want to be looking over my shoulder for the next five years, you know, wondering if somebody's gecko that I sold them last year is going to, you know, in their second or third year of breeding or after a photo shoot. Like I said, I don't know. I, I hope I, I originally, you know, whenever, whenever I first started thinking about it and I, and I first put together the photo shoot, cause that didn't come to me until I saw this third gecko and she, I had just had a big photo shoot with her. And it was the very beginning of her mm. season. Like she, she laid her first clutch of duds, and then we had that we had that photo shoot. She laid her first clutch of duds, and then I noticed this. So it was like, whoa, hang on. And that's when I kind of put it all together on the photo shoot possibility. But we've already talked to other people that haven't had a high flash photo shoot and are seeing symptoms. So that that specific stressor is definitely not it, you know. But it could have been. An, you know, an add on stressor. I don't know. But like I said, I just, at the end of the day, I didn't want to be looking over my shoulder and worrying about if something could go wrong on some animals that I sold. And, and, and furthermore, I didn't want more animals to have to suffer with this condition because if, if you can take the ones that are still healthy and just not breed them and not do any high flash photo shoots and I'm not going to ship them anywhere, you know. It, right. Keep the stress low, like tr treat those specific animals with a certain different, you know, kid gloves on and pet mm -hmm. them all out responsibly to the right pet homes that I know for sure are going to be. I've got I've got a, a teacher that's a, one of my gr best customers at our big, big show in Arlington. And, you know, when I when I reached out to him, he actually has uh, he's got two from that line. And whenever I reached out to him and told him. You know, he was like, "What?" Well, but his were already pets anyway, but he still paid, right. he still paid premium prices for them. So I felt it the right thing to do to even reach out to him and say, Hey, you know, I know you don't plan on using these to breed anything. You don't plan on breeding, but if you should plan on breeding, these aren't suitable, you know? And he, right. he's one that told me, uh, you know, he's got a big educational facility that he just acquired. He's a teacher, but he's got all kind of new grants and stuff that he's building a uh, real cool, like reptile laboratory. Basically, he's got all kind of cool stuff. And so he wants to, he wants me to donate however many I need to, to him. He's got plenty of room for them and he, they'll be in very caring hands with him. And, you know, furthermore, it'll be a donation to the, to the, to his facility or whatever. Um, so yeah. stuff like that, I've got... Even with geckos yeah. that aren't even breeding, and you knew that weren't going to be bred, you still felt the need to go out and reach out to those people and kind of just make things right the best you could. Well, yeah, because even, even if they're not going to be bred, Evan, I mean, this is this is a customer that's bought from me several years in a row and probably will continue buying geckos from me in, in future years at, at that expo. And I didn't want, you know, there to be any kind of... any kind of... anything going wrong... And him not being disclosed about it first, you know what I mean? If I had, right, if yeah. I had the knowledge that it might happen, and, and again, possibly save the animal from even experiencing any issues if it is certain triggers that's setting them off. You know, hey, make sure you got you keep this gecko. You know, don't do any big photo shoots. Don't breed it. You know, don't give it any stressful situations. Don't ship it. You know, um, so. That's that's kind of where I stood on that, um, but yeah, there's there's definitely plenty of awesome homes to get these sent to that are going to be you know great homes for them and, and for them to live their life as healthy as you know they can. And again, I've only experienced three issues in my collection, and I have two of those in my possession. The other one is at a great pet only home already um so there's not a whole lot of like special needs animals that need to be adopted out it's just animals that need to make sure that they don't get adopt get sold to the wrong person that's going to turn around and try to breed them and and further right you know further pass on this possible genetic issue you know 
down the road. Uh, that, that's I just want to yeah, do my part. Yeah. I want to do my part on snubbing whatever I have out there, and and that's how I felt that was the best way to do that. Yeah, totally agree. I think uh, you handled it really well, um, given the situation. Um, and with that said, like looking back, like I said, you handled it really well, and I think you did a great job of doing how you handled things and everything. Looking back, do you think you would have done anything different with a different point of view or, um, you know, it's popped in three different females. You think you could have possibly found out, okay, I see the second female having issues or anything of that sort. Do you have any sort of regrets or anything that you have looking back? Like I said, in the post, man, it, obviously looking back, I wish I would have noticed it when that second female showed that different issue and put two and two together. Um, because that would have saved a whole lot of, headache and heartache in, in the first place. Um, at, other than that, but I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty. again, you know, in, in the moment yeah. I, I was, it was only a few years ago, but I've learned so much more about that species in the last couple of years. Um, you know, we've really been expanding our collection a lot with, with the fat tails in the last few years. And so I, I, I didn't know exactly what I was looking at. I didn't understand it on the degree that I do now, you know, and that's, right that's the best I can say to that. You know, yeah, I do regret not, not putting it together right then, but it, it is what it is at this point. You know, it's, I just, I just wanted yeah. to, I just want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing as, as much as I can, you know, now that I've realized exactly what, I, what it is that I'm looking at and, and confirmed it. Yeah. And you, you know, you kind of started off with Leo's and, Leos and AFTs, a lot of people compare them, but they're totally two different species when it comes to care and breeding and feeding. And now that you have that experience also, that definitely probably helps out to you in that situation now that you're in this year breeding, you know, AFT started from your very first season breeding. You probably are two different people when it comes to that experience and that knowledge of the species, which probably definitely helps you out. Yeah, ab perspective. absolutely, man. Uh, you, like you said, a lot of people compare them and think they're they're very much the same, which to keep one as a pet, they are very much the same. You know, if somebody's got, got a pet gecko that they're, they're, they only have a couple of animals to tend to and, and they're able to stay on top of it pretty well, they are uh, very similar to keep as a Leo. But to breed, it, the, the honest answer is they just require more attention than Leos. You, you can't, you can't, you know, uh, the way I say it to people is a, a lot of people not in my collection, but some people neglect their leopard geckos and they still thrive. You know what I mean? And even, right. even, even successfully breed them under neglectful conditions. You can't do that to a fat tail. You neglect a fat tail and it's going to show you real quick. Um, so mm. I think that's a big factor, you know, why a lot of people get in and then get out of fat tails. You know, you'll have, you'll see a lot of leopard gecko breeders get, get a bunch of fat tails and then two years later they're selling them all off because they, it, it's, not that they can't do it, it's just that they realize that it's a little bit more than they expected as far as the care to breed them. The females will go down really hard if you don't stay on top of them, and the eggs are a lot more delicate. You know, you'll think you got a cooler f full of fertile eggs and only half of them hatch. You know, they, they, they're not nearly as prolific, and that's, that's why they're, you know, they're a different, a different beast, you know? Yeah. Now, for people who are kind of <clears throat> in fat tails or even in Leos, um, and they're hearing this for the first time or haven't read the post yet and they're hearing this from you, what is something that you want other people to kind of learn from your mistakes and learn from your experiences with this and kind of this whole thing? I know there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast who have been breeding for a couple of years and there's a lot of, a ton of new people who listen to this podcast. This is their first or second year breeding or they're getting into it and want to learn from these breeders who are on the podcast. So what could a lot of people learn from the mistakes that you've made or how you've handled this situation? What could you pass on to other people who are listening to this and want to take something from your experiences and what you have to offer? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, honestly, uh, I wish that I would have reached out to more people from, you know, I, 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 th I feel like a lot of a lot of people see something wrong with a certain animal, and if they've had it for a certain amount of time, they just assume fault. Especially newer keepers, right? You know, um, they just assume, oh, I did something wrong. Uh, I overheated that gecko, or uh, you know, 
I stressed it out in some kind of way. And, and, you know, that's, that's one thing that I, I, I feel like needs to, needs to be less prevalent. You know, I, I wish I would have reached out to more people and, and, and kind of bounced it off of other more breeders to see if anybody else was, was dealing with this. Cause now that I've put that out there, like I did, we're, we're getting several people coming out of the woodworks that are, Hey, you know, my gecko has this. And, and I just thought I had the same, just like I just said, you know, I, I thought, I thought it was from this or I thought I messed it up or, you know, I thought I overheated it and it, they very well may have, it might be from that event that triggered it, but it, that's probably the, the biggest takeaway that I could give as far as the mistake you know, that, that I made at that point is not, not being more vocal about it or putting it out in the groups and just kind of assuming it to be a one-off. And, you know, I, 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 right. I just tried to continue improving my nutrition and thinking, okay, well maybe I was just low on that. That was my initial thought on, on the first female is that it was something really metabolic because I really didn't know what I was doing then, you know? Um, I thought maybe I just wasn't supplementing properly and, and that, you know, didn't have enough multivitamins in it or something like that. Something simple that I was just missing, you know? Um, now I know yeah. that now I know that that's, it's not nearly that complicated. You know, it's, it's much more basic, but still very, yeah. still very complicated at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> still have no idea what's going on. Yeah. It's, it, it's a crap shoot as far as yeah. figuring out exactly, man. Like I said, I, I feel like it's, it's. It's gonna be really difficult to dial it in without some serious, you know, medical, you know, testing and right. stuff like that. Yeah, and we have to remember we're working with animals. <laughs> like, exactly, it's not just exactly you know, that's A B C D, and then get this whole thing. You know, we're working with live animals, and sometimes there's just things we can't explain or we don't know or don't have the knowledge yet to figure out what's going on. Exactly that, man. And I've had a lot. Of, I've had several of my friends that like aren't in the in the reptile industry that i've told about this they're like oh man well you know you can't just you know keep trying with that group and figure it out you know <laughs> that's a hard hit and i'm like well i could you know and just keep everything right. but every animal that i breed in my eyes from that line i'm risking putting that animal in jeopardy that put that animal from a perfectly healthy gecko to a crooked gecko or a gecko that can, it has to be tongue fed because it's you know striking off every time it tries to strike something and morally that's not okay with me at all you know that that part of the equation is not okay so if we could figure it out some other kind of way i'd be all for it but i don't see a way to do that you know what i mean and yeah. like you said these are animals we're working with they're not they're not little you know we call them living art but they're not actually little palettes that we're painting that we can just throw away you know we have to respect those animals and give them the 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 care that they deserve and the the consideration they deserve you know right yeah you can't just you mess up on a gecko you can't just throw it out and start over on a new canvas it's you know a living animal you hatch that thing you once you breed that animal you kind of make that commitment to go ahead and make sure if anything that's wrong you're there as a breeder to take care of it until you know at the end of its days or give it on and pass it to someone else that you know is going to give it a good home, which I know you're definitely doing with all the animals that you've hatched. Um, and yeah, it's definitely something that people got to keep in mind when breeding. It's not just all, you know, rainbows and unicorns. There's things that go wrong, things that go right. And you kind of just got to take the good with the bad when it comes to this so, stuff. Yeah, totally. Um, it, it, yeah. And, and it's not going to be hard to find the right homes for these guys. It, it's one of those deals. Like I bring a, I might bring them to the expo, but if it's a really big expo, I probably won't even have them on the table. I'll just wait for that right customer to come along. That's like, oh man, that white adder is so awesome, and you know, a, a young kid or something that's like, oh man, I really want that, but my mom's not gonna let me get that for five hundred dollars. You know, well, check this right. out. You know, I can I can adopt this out to you for really cheap, and you know, yeah, I know a lot of people had concerns with that. Like, are these geckos gonna be too messed up? You can't find homes or anything like that. What do you think Man, of, it, for any of that stuff? Like I said, I've got over a dozen animals that some of which I've, you know, I only, I only bought back and, and had returned to me for it for five animals. I'm sorry. Um, and in addition to that, I've got over a dozen animals in my collection from that line and they're all perfectly healthy. Nothing, no issues at all. You know, there's three animals that have serious issues and everybody else is a normal fat tail. 
not normal, but you know, right. Physically. Um, so it, I don't think it's going to be an issue, especially with the full disclosure that you that I'm giving to everybody of, look, this is what's going on with these animals. It's, you know, there's a possibility that something might come up, but in order to lessen that possibility, don't stress it out, you know, set it up in a really nice enclosure in, in a low traffic part of your house and enjoy it. Hold it as, you know, hold it every so often, but you know, don't overdo it. You know, it's, it's, it's just like anything else that needs a little bit of a little bit more care and attention, you know, and the ones that do, yeah. the ones that are kind of messed up, you know, like I said, one of them has been placed since not long after she showed me issues. Um, and the, uh, and the other one, one of them is my original. She won't go anywhere. She'll be here forever. And then the one that just recently showed issues that kind of dawned the light on everything. I've already reached out to the girl that, to the lady that has the first one or the second one, rather the one that I placed. Um, and she wants this one too. Um, so I'm going to just give her this one to, to let her take care of it. Cause she knows, she knows exactly what she's dealing with. Cause she already has the issue with the animal that she adopted from me a while back. Um, so nice. Yeah. yeah. And you're giving, you know, great stunning looking animals from a great line, good homes and, you know, not anything unethical and you're doing everything the right way. And it kind of even just takes courage for someone to go out. I know you talked about earlier, like something that you wish you would have done is reached out to other people. Even just doing the post that you made took a lot of courage because you had no idea what people were going to say. People could have slandered you, could have like said, never be the AFT again. You, Dude, you didn't I, know what was going to happen. I've so. been so stressed out about all this for the last two months. Yeah. And like last week, last week we went on, vac we had a family vacation and then we had, I had an expo. Literally we came home the Thursday and we left the Friday for an expo in Oklahoma city and we're in South Texas. So oh, it was like a eight hour drive, nine hour drive right after getting back from family vacation on the, at the river. So it was, it was a hectic couple weeks, these last few weeks. But during that family vacation, I took the time out to get kind of a rough draft of, of everything that I put out there um, and kind of get my thoughts together about it. And then once I got home from that expo, I was able to sit down with my notes, you know, from previous seasons, as far as like exact details of this year, you know, this year, this year, this, you know, make sure I had all my, my dates right on everything. And again, that's why I wanted to just read it out in this format because I didn't want to miss anything that I had sat down and, and really figured out. Um, but yeah, I, I've been stressed to the max about this. Like you said, you, you never know how everybody's going to receive something like this. And and I'm still scared. I'm still scared that, you know, newbies, newbies are going to see this or see my post or see people talking about this and get scared of getting a white out at all. And it's going to hurt the white, you know, the white out market. I hope that doesn't happen because like I like I can't stress enough. There's so many thousands and thousands and thousands of perfectly healthy white outs out there. And, and this, it's possible that this might not only be you know, there might, there might be some normal animals out there that, that have issues from the same line. Um, I, I think there's one that, that a friend of mine said that she she tracked down, but that one might be questionable. I don't know. Um, but I just can't I can't stress enough that it's not all whiteouts. It's not like enigmas where like if it's enigma, it's gonna definitely have a tendency for or, or a possibility to have a yes. It's not right. that's not this okay. This is like a specific line. That's that's the best way I can I can voice it. Um, right, and that's another thing. People could have totally ran with this and said, like you said, all of these morphs and from like regardless of where you get it from, they're all messed up. And Seth is saying, there's like, don't take pictures of any of your AFTs because they're gonna get messed up. Right, I mean, right. People could have taken this so many ways. So I'm glad you reached out and we got it all set it all on the podcast people could hear it all out and even just you taking notes a lot of people don't even who are who breed don't even take notes on their animals they just have what morph it is and maybe their parents and that's kind of it i'm so glad that i had the record keeping that i that i've started since the very beginning because it was it was not easy but it was relatively easy to go back and and really figure out you know not only who was related to who and all that, which some people don't even keep track of that. But in addition, I was able to track down the handful of animals that I had already sold, even though some of them were like at expos, for example, you know, um, right. 
I, I don't keep track of every animal I sell at expos, but a couple of these, you know, they were easy, easy to track down. Um, because back then I was keeping, you know, more specific records as far as even, even what I sold at expos, you know? Um, no. but yeah, I, I can't stress enough record keeping, you know, it's, it's everything in this hobby. And if you, if you don't have some kind of system, definitely figure one out. I use, um, yeah. they're called tally books. It's like a little, little small book. That's what, that's my hard copies of everything. I, I have an Excel spreadsheet on my computer that I use, but everything's also hard copy at the end of the season, you know, um, just to keep track of everything, right. you know? I know. And if you didn't, if you didn't keep track of who you sold animals to or ID numbers or whatever you have going on, you could have just had all this information and no one who you sold to would have known. And it could have just spiraled out into something totally different where, like you said, you kind of covered your ground and it could have bit you out in the butt, even if you did find out and wanted to help people. But you had no idea who got those animals from you. Yeah, no, I was, I was definitely fortunate that, like I said, it, I'm glad, and I'm glad this, this eye opener happened this year and not two seasons from now when I had hundreds of them out there by then, you know what I mean? Cause I, right. I've been working on this group for several years and I had, I had 10 or 12 females that are, you know, a couple of them had bred last year and a bunch of them were going to be breeding this year. So I was going to, I was definitely going to be producing a lot of them this year and I was really really happy like I said in the post with where they got visually and it was just definitely an eye opener but I'm glad it was this year I wish it was last year even the year before that that I, that I opened my eyes to it but I'm yeah. glad it was not several seasons from now when it wasn't you know traceable or catchable or you know too many of them out there um, right like I said maybe hopefully I'm just like super unlucky on this and, and there's you know very very few out there and that's kind of what it seems like in, in the grand scheme of things because like i said we've we've been able to track down maybe a dozen or so uh, including my three that that have significant issues so cool now going to i think just the future of you know next steps you talked about this line and you're kind of scrapping this line so what's next for what's to come for you and other lines of this morph and other things to kind of get where your breeding stock is to kind of get to that line that you have that you're petting all these animals out to, but still having that stunning morph that you're going to develop um, and ha hopefully have a really healthy line of these. Well, luckily um, I had a group uh, or a pair of white out head Oreo. They're also head patty though, um, that are from a completely different line, hundred percent. Um, no zero relation at all and lots of lineage behind this line that has no no reports of any issues at all um and that line i i've that pair i've fortunately had great great success with this year um she laid i don't know i think i hatched like six or eight babies from her and nice. now it's a white out het oreo het patty to an oreo het patty and I was shooting, I was hoping for an Oreo patty or a white out Oreo patty, like, like it's on my shirt right here. That's what I was really hoping for. Yeah. But they didn't, she didn't throw me a single patty, but she threw me like two Oreos and all the rest were white out Oreo. I'm sorry, two Oreos, two white outs and like four white out Oreos. So it was nice. a great group that I hatched off of her. Um, so that's going to kind of be my foundation to build from. And that's those animals I posted uh, just a couple days ago. Um, they have a lot more tangerine in them. So that line's going to take some refinement to get that stark black and white that were presented on that other line. Um, that that tangerine on the white out Oreos really kind of, I, I don't want to say muddies up the background, but it kind of makes it gray out a little bit more. Whereas some other lines have more of a stark white background. So that'll take a little bit of, a little bit of selective breeding to get back to that, that contrast that we had in that other, that other line, but we'll get there. Um, we've got a couple of, I think I've got a 1.3 that I'm definitely keeping from that stuff. And I might add another male to keep from that, that are all really, really good looking animals. So that'll kind of be the foundation nice. to rebuild. Only downfall is I, I, they're all head patty or possible head patty. Nice. Well, you didn't, if you didn't, 
you know, hit any this year kind of gives you a better off chance for those babies you hatched out to not be hit patty. Yeah, yeah. The only, like I said, the only downfall is that that other group I did have some pure like only het Oreo animals in that other group, so that'll be kind of a work to you know get that back. I do have some pure Oreos that aren't that are from a different line, but not with the whiteout in there. So it basically we have we pretty much have a little bit of everything except for ghost and now white out okay. and now white out oreo without any hits <laughs> um <laughs> that's basically the only yeah. genetics that we don't have and that we don't have uh like a pure or het free group of it's just, i have a bunch of little groups of everything basically um we've got a lot yeah. but it's it's a, a little bit of everything um which is how i like it it gives us a lot of variety you know we'll be hatching Next year, next year we should definitely have some Oreo patties. Um, it, that that group there is just insane. It, it, I've got a whole nother a whole nother group other than the ones I just explained that are all that without the whiteout. That are just you know really nice patties that are head Oreo and some Oreos that are head patty. So that stuff's gonna go together next or some of it'll go late this season, um, like towards towards the holidays, and then most of it'll go okay next spring. Um, so nice. cool. ne next season should be really, really awesome. I I've held back, Oh, like over 30 this year, female fat tails oh, wow. or maybe a couple of males, but like we really, really, really focused on building our, our fat tail group this year. And a lot, you know, none of those are very few. Of those are going to go, you know, anytime in the next year or two, we grow, we grow ours out to about 18 months. It, if we do it okay. less than 18 months, it's it's one of those that's just like 45 grams already at a year old. But a year is definitely like as young as I'll mess with them. Um, Got it. But I prefer 18 months, especially if it's one, you know. And then if it's a really slow grower, I'll give her a whole two plus years. You know, I've got, I've got a female on my rack right now that's only like 38, 40 grams. And I don't think she's going to ever get bigger than that. She just doesn't eat all that much. You can put her six crickets in there and she'll eat two of them. And wow. so no matter how often you feed her, you know, she just doesn't eat that much quantity and she just never grew that quickly. And I'll probably eventually use her, but it, I, I might not, I might end up not even messing with her cause she's not, she's not as robust as I like them. You know, uh, again, like I said, the fat tails kind of, they're a little more finicky than the, the females are a little more finicky whenever you breed them. So you gotta, you gotta make sure they're good and healthy and robust before you, before you even think about messing with them. Yeah, totally, totally different from what you'd expect for a leopard gecko. A lot of people just think that, you know, if you're just getting a colony of AFTs and people are like, oh, it looks like a leopard gecko, it probably just put it in the same conditions, throw it in a rack and <laughs> let them do their thing. But it doesn't seem to be the case with a ton of people that I hear from and talk to who just work with AFTs. No, not at all. They're, they're definitely a different monster. I, I love it, though. I love the challenge and I yeah. love... I think that there's still, obviously, with all this, there's so much to be learned with this species. They're still very, I mean, if you think about it, obviously, wild-caught A AFTs have been around forever. We, we've seen those in the pet stores for as long as we remember. But the morph AFTs right. have only just started getting imported in, like, 2008-ish, like, that time period. So that's kind of when that, yeah. that import began on the actual visual morphs. I don't know if you know this, Evan, but... All of the visual morphs in fat tails came from the wild. Really? It's, yeah, okay. it's, it's not like leopard geckos where a bunch of the morphs have popped up in private collections. All of the morphs in fat tails have been imported and then propagated in captivity. But they originally came from the wild as, as visual examples. And then, you know, th there's been combos even, like the Caramel Zulu, for, for example, was actually brought in together as the speculation because you, it's almost impossible to find a caramel that's not possible het Zulu or, or het Zulu at, or a Zulu that's not possible het caramel. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's it's definitely a cool a cool thing about the species is that, like I said, I, I feel like they're, in the grand scheme of things, if you compare them to leopard geckos or, you know, some other species, it, they're kind of in their infancy as far as what's going on with the visual uh, the visual product that, that people are able to to achieve right and even think about breeding and captivity think about leopard geckos being you know bred as far as you know early 70s late 60s 
AFTs really haven't been bred in captivity for that long of a time period compared to Leopard Gecko. So there's a ton of possibilities, even just thinking from that standpoint, what can be done in terms of improving husbandry, um, talk about medical things that uh, may pop up in AFTs and even just from morphs of, you know, possibly popping out something crazy um, from a, you know, a captive private collection. That's, that's definitely possible. I mean, like you said, it, they, there's all, the amount of people that are working with fat tails has expanded so much in the last couple of years. Um, and they're just getting more and more popular and there there's a really high demand for them. And so there's, there's a lot of people wanting to work with them and, and getting into them by the day, you know? So yeah, there's no telling right. what, there's no telling what's going to happen with this species in the next five years or 10 years, even, you know, I mean, that there, there's still, there's still combos. Insane. There's still combos that don't exist. Um, or there's combos that just, just start being hatched this year. Um, the, uh, for example, the Amel Patty Oreo combo, um, I think I'm pretty sure the first one was hatched this year in overseas. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've seen my mango project that, I, that I've been working on for several yeah, yeah. years. Well, that stuff is all, it, it's all head email, but it's also possible head patty, possible head Oreo. So that's a triple combo that okay. I could, I could end up producing in that, in that group eventually. Um, and that that's, you know, those guys are just awesome looking. Um, that's 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 a <laughs> yeah. project that's a project that I've just kept really I actually sold the very very first animal from that group at the last expo last weekend. Um so that's wow. I'm just now if starting no Seth, he doesn't like to sell stuff. All the <laughs> stuff <he's> sell. <laughs> they mess they mess with me at all the expos. Some of the vendors will walk by and they'll be like, Oh yeah, you're not not for sale, not for sale, not for sale. Because even at the expos I'll bring <laughs> I'll bring a bunch of stuff that I just want to show to people because I'm so excited and proud of them. Right. But but I still got I still got work to do with them, you know. And so, but <laughs> but that that mango project, I know a lot of people have been really interested in it and want to want to get some from that. And that's that's something that I'm gonna probably start trickling out a little bit this year. Um, if not this okay. year, if not this year, definitely next year we'll be letting go of some of that stuff. We've been, we've been hoarding it for far too nice. long. But uh, <laughs> yes. Definitely. It's, it's going to come to fruition right now. Actually, I think I've got like half a dozen eggs from that project sitting right below me right now that are all looking good. So Ooh, nice. So when it comes to morphs and stuff that you're, you're working with in your collection, I know you have a ton of stuff. What morphs do you have? What morphs don't you have? Talk about kind of what you're specializing with over at Huss Herps. Okay. Well, like I said, I have with the fat tails, I have everything but ghosts in my collection. Ghost is the only thing I don't have. Um, and I don't take, I don't intend to get right now just because there's, that's something we need to talk about too with fat tails. There's an infertility issue with caramels and ghosts. All females to my knowledge that are visual caramel or visual ghosts are infertile. Um, the caramel girls, you can, you that. can breed them and they'll just lay duds. The, the ghost girls, you can actually, they actually have some issues sometimes if you breed them. They like try. They won't even lay eggs. They'll form the eggs and they resorb them, but sometimes they have trouble with the resorption and can can fail. Um, so that's a morph that I'm not really probably going to add to my collection because I've I already had caramel in my collection. Whenever I found out that the caramel females were infertile, so that's something I already have to deal with and kind of work around. Which it is is it's able to work around. You know, especially when we can for the most part, you know, dictate the sex of these with, with temp sex incubation. Um, you know, if you know you were going to have visual caramels in a pairing, temp sex it all male, you know, and then to make your hets, you just obviously need a, a, a het free or a wild caught, you know, or F1 female to go to your visual male and you can make hundred percent hets and you can, you can create groups for people to be able to still work with them and, and produce awesome looking animals. And, with that said, even the female visuals that end up, you know, temp sex male, but end up females, people are ha more than happy to buy those as pets for, for a decent, for a fair price, you know? Um, so it's, it's still work worth working with them. And the same goes for ghosts. It's just that I don't want to add it to my collection just to have another thing that I have to kind of skate around on the, on the infertility part. But so back to what we actually do have, we have, um, we've got some 
Oreo patty stuff without the whiteout. We've got that group of the whiteout Oreo patty that I just talked about, the 1.3 that's kind of replacing this stuff. Um, we've got some straight up AMLs. We've got some whiteout head AML, head patty stuff that's going that we should hopefully be producing some AML patties from. Um, next season for sure, we should be, be at that point. Uh, maybe even this season. I've got some cooking right now that that are double hat to double hat so we'll see um and then we've got uh some pure oreo stuff uh, i love white out white out is is my favorite gene all to, all hands down with with fat tails because there's so much variety uh, visually you can you can have such different animals with just a straight up white out with no other genes involved um so that's Probably my reasoning for them being my favorite is is the variety that they offer that they bring to the table. Um, they're they're kind of becoming less of my favorite with this issue that we recently dealt with. <laughs> just joking, just totally joking, totally joking on that, totally joking on that. Like I said, that's a, that's a very isolated issue. Um, no, um, right. then we've got some wild caught stuff. I've got a one point two of wild caught. Um, I've got, we've got a little bit of everything. Some caramel Zulu stuff, some Zulu stuff, or some caramel stuff without the Zulu. I don't have any Zulu stuff without caramel. I don't think anybody does. Um, and the caramel Zulu, I don't have white out in the caramel Zulu because I'm not crazy about what it does to the Zulu pattern. I like the the clean arrowhead Zulu pattern that that, that makes and the white out kind of does tricks to that sometimes. So that's probably the only group I don't have white out infused in, but um yeah that's about it i think yeah. I, I think that's about all there is um you got you got oreos recessive amels recessive patternless recessive that's one thing i also knew or are starting to learn about afts is they have so many recessive morphs compared to like say leopard geckos where there's a mix of you know dominant you got your incomplete dominant your recessives and AFTs, it seems to be just like a ton of recessive morphs that everybody's working with. And then just line breeding those recessives. There is a stripe. So everything, stripe is a dominant morph. So anything that you see okay. with the white stripe going all the way down, that's it's either dominant or incomplete dominant. It's kind of impossible to tell because a super stripe technically is just going to throw 100% stripes, but it's not going to look any different than a striped animal, right? Got it. If you think about it. Um, so yeah. I have some some theories about that that because i i've talked to people that are like man i've got this and it doesn't matter what i throw, put it to it throws a hundred percent strikes and that makes me think like well okay. maybe it is incomplete dominant but we just can't see the the super forms because it's the still difference just a strike right both forms. um yeah. and then you have whiteout is an incomplete dominant and whiteout actually has a lethal form to it if you produce a super whiteout it is a lethal uh gene so for that reason, nobody breeds white out to white out, or most people, most ethical people don't breed white out to white out because 25% of the offspring, in theory, or by, by the odds, either won't hatch, or if they do hatch, they'll die within a few hours. Um, so that's something that came to light years ago, and any any breeder worth their salt doesn't even mess with white out to white out at all because it's just it just doesn't make sense. Um, right. So that's the two dominant or incomplete dominance that there are and then um yeah everything else i guess is recessive caramel ghost oreo amel patty it's not as many as leopard geckos though you don't have eight different eye genes and three different albinos <laughs> and all that nonsense yeah. yeah so it's a little easier to keep track of and it's a little easier for people that are just getting in to you know not have as much to worry about and it not be so stressful you know like I've right. I've thought uh, f f several times I've been like, man, I wouldn't mind getting a pair of ball pythons without the visual amazing animals they have these <laughs> days. But then I'm like, no, I don't even want to mess with that that you know total yeah just nonsense five of, uh, million genes. Oh, there's so much <laughs> they have so and there's new new every you know every month they come out with something new. It seems like every day. <laughs> importing stuff and oh new gene yeah 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 <laughs> Add that to the list yeah well and yeah. That, that you know like you said earlier you know fat tails we might end up starting to get a little bit of you know new stuff popping up or new other new stuff coming in um but uh who knows 
Yeah, like I said, I, yeah. I I think that there's still a lot to be learned with this species, and a lot there's a lot of people starting to do more selective breeding with them, and not just producing visual you know recessives, but actually refining things. And so that's yeah. starting that's starting to really I think show itself in the in this side of the hobby. Um, I've seen some people's you know, just tangerine emails are just insane with how much they've been are white out emails and people just line breed them and they look totally different from what you'd see with just, you know, combining two recessive traits, which is pretty crazy. Yep. They've got, they've got such vast variety. I mean, they've got some that people actually label them as because it's what they look like, like peachy emails or peach emails because they're, they're totally peached out. And then you'll have the, the tang emails that are like almost red, you know, um, right. those, those are just insane and and you'll get both from one line sometimes you know you, you'll have one pairing that'll give you one animal that's just just like with any other you know whenever you start refining and line breeding it, it's not all gonna be 100 percent. you know that's the poly the tang is the polymorphic side of it you know that's more right. like more like the old stripe or the tang you know the severity of tang in in a group of tangs in leos so um, that's, that's kind of the fun part of it is, is never knowing even when they hatch, you can't really tell how they're going to turn out because they, they're pretty bland when they hatch and then it takes them a couple months to kind of start coloring up. And then I don't yeah. know, how, I don't know how many people know exactly how my collection works, but I hatch them and I put them on the rack and one of my sons starts them and then they move on to my other, my other son. And so they, they have my babies, they have care of my babies under supervision. I go through them every so often to make sure they're. But right. anymore, I don't even have to. They've got stuff so dialed in, man. I'll check a couple tubs and everything's perfect. I'm like, yeah. Um, but if you haven't listened to Seth's first episode, make sure to head over and listen to that because the way they do stuff, it's all streamlined. It's amazing. But for that reason, it's cool for me because I don't see them every day. You know, they're they're maintaining the babies every day, every day. And then they'll get to me three racks later and I'm like, whoa, this looks cool, you know, or whenever I'm. <laughs> Whenever I'm spot checking their racks, I'll, I'll open something yeah. up. I'll be like, "Whoa, that's that's really looking nice." Let's look at that in a couple more weeks, you know. And so it, it's right. fun. It's like it's like Christmas sometimes. Whenever I whenever I rotate all the racks around, and I'll get like four new babies on my rack, and and move and give them open space for the new babies. It's like, oh yeah, cool, new stuff to look at, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 amazing. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you was, so correct me if I'm wrong. AFTs are still being imported, right? Yes. Wild yes. caught AFT heavily. Okay, heavily. There's still a huge market for them. People, really? Okay. People buy them for dirt cheap and sell them for thirty bucks, forty bucks, fifty bucks, sixty bucks, even at the expos. Um, if you see a fat tail for anything sixty dollars or less in an expo, unless it's like I'm talking about, like a special case that the breeder's telling you it's something wrong with it and it's you know, or, or some kind of physical deformity, it's most likely a wild caught. Uh, most breeders are not going to sell anything captive bred for less than a hundred dollars. Um, it, it's just, like I said, the species takes so much more to work with and so much more attention to work with than, than leopard geckos that it's not really worth messing with them to sell, to sell them for, for as cheap as you see somebody sell them. Some people sell them for. So anytime I see a, a fat tail for 40 or 50 bucks in an expo, I know it's a walk off, you know, um, mm -hmm. which I've, I've acquired some of those and quarantined them and treated them and everything. And like I said, I have a 1.3 in my collection that, that I'm working with that I've had for several years, but, um, I'm sorry, 1.2 wild caught. And then I have a couple of F ones that I've gotten from here and there. Okay. But, uh, they're, they're definitely still being imported. I wish they weren't cause they don't, I, I feel like, I guess, I guess there's a market for them because people are still buying them, right? It, it, they'd stop importing. It, <laughs> yeah. If people stop buying them, people, they'd stop importing them, I guess. So. Right. You know, I guess people, people see these high, higher price points at the breeders' tables and, and they can't or aren't willing to, you know, reach that price point. And so it's understandable. You know, they, they fall in love with the species at my table and, you know, they might go grab an import. And if, if you take care of it right and you, and you tend to it properly and you, take the right precautions there's nothing wrong with with getting an imported animal um but right. just the process of it is what i'm not okay with you know but yeah obviously they got here at some point and i have to be okay with it on some level because i love working with the species so much you know so yeah people will go to your table in arbc and then love your stuff and then go buy from the importer <laughs> for like 20 bucks it happens all the AFTs. time yeah you know how it goes they spent stand at your table for 30 minutes <laughs> soaking up all the information from somebody that actually works with them and then go get the Go get right. the cheapo, but 
It, it, yeah. You got to take the good with the bad. It, it, you know. So because of that, are there a lot of people that are using, is it kind of like a ball python thing where people are just importing them to try to pop out morphs or people are sending other people to Africa to get them and try to find morphs or how intense is it with people trying to get into the morph things with the wild caught um, stock? I honestly couldn't tell you, Evan, because I'm not really on that side of the game at all. Um, I, yeah. have, I have my small group of wild caught that I work with just to have that, that pure genetics to be able to bounce in, in you know, into projects. But um, I'm not really involved in that, in that part of the market at all. So I couldn't really tell you, man. Um, okay. Overall, I think, I think that there's there's obviously some people that that's all they're focusing on, and then there's some people that are doing both, that you know might have a really nice collection and and are also getting getting a lot of other stuff to try to you know see what they can pop out. Um, I don't know what the odds are of stuff like that. I feel like I, I don't know. I feel like there's probably somebody along the way that's probably weeding out a lot of those visuals these days. Like back 15 years ago, I'm sure they were just sending stuff by the hundreds. But now that the market has gotten to where it is on them, I'm sure that there's people much higher up the ladder that's having a better eye for those in those big imported, you know, batches and picking out some of that higher end stuff and piecing it out to make more, I mean, to make right. more money on them, you know, especially if it's yeah. something new. If it's something new, you know, something that's already existing in in the hobby, but just getting a wild caught visual or head, which that happens. You know, I, I've got an F1 on my rack that's, that's Het Patty. Um, people have Het Oreos. People have Oreos out there that they've gotten imported, like you're talking about. Just get a group, and once you get to looking at it, like, hang on, this isn't a normal. You know, it's it's not coloring up like it's supposed yeah. to. And then they test breed it and end up with, with a visual or a Het, you know, wild caught. And that, that's cool as far as genetic diversity, obviously, but that's right. not going to be on anywhere on the same level as if they found something new. And totally different. Yeah, that was wild. Like another gene that they were bringing, and that would be with where the market's at right now on the fat tails. That people would go insane for that. But again, yeah. I feel like I feel like some yeah. of the, I feel like some of the big dogs have first shot at that stuff. So uh, I don't even yeah <laughs> I don't even worry about that. I'll, I'll I'll get into it once they once they get it figured out and and have it out there. You know. Okay. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. And then even from just the standpoint of how the market is for AFTs, you think about how great the market is for stuff that's been in captivity, that's been, you know, bred, that's killer stuff, that's been put, you know, the time and love into develop these lines. It's kind of like there's no need for that. Like, if you got, you know, what you're doing, stuff that you're doing and breeding over there, it's like you got a thing that's working and you're creating awesome animals. So at that point, it's like, you know, you just, you do you pretty much type of thing. Yeah, totally, man. Totally. Yeah. Now, I know, I know a lot of people who especially work with leopard geckos, they are scared to get into AFTs because, you know, they hear about their care and then breeding is, you know, somewhat more different than Cric leopard geckos. And, and crickets. Only free crickets. Yes, crickets. I'm crickets is that. the big one. Crickets is the big one. Yeah, I'm sure y'all hear the crickets <laughs> in the background. Um, yeah, no, a lot of people do are hesitant to, to get into them. And, and my advice to them is to start real, just like... It's my same advice that I give to people that are just starting out in the leopard gecko, you know, getting a group of leopard geckos. Start small. Get a pair. Get a trio. You know, it, it, see how you like them. Don't, don't decide you're going to dive all the way into them and invest thousands of dollars in them. Get a cheap pair of hex, you know, or even a pair of wild card or a pair of F1s, you know, preferably. Um, it, get, get a small group of them and see how you like them. Um, and not all of them are exclusively cricket eaters. Um, I personally raise mine on dubia and worms. Um, we start them on dubia and then we offer worms after they've had two or three meals on dubia and probably 60 to 75% of them we can get on both. Um, and then the other ones to stay on dubia. Now, even the ones that I raise on dubia, I want to make this totally clear. And I tell this to everybody at the expos, even the ones that I raise on dubia and worms, sometimes that once they get older, I guess it's like usually towards ovulation time and their appetite gets suppressed, sometimes they'll insist on crickets. And so I always just tell people, even though, even if you're buying an animal from me that I'm telling you it eats dubia and worms, you have to at least be open-minded to using crickets. They tell me, nope, I ain't doing crickets. I will not do crickets. I won't sell them a fat tail. Um, because, and, and I used to be that person. I used to be hellbent about crickets and I would, I would transition fat tails from that I got from breeders that were on crickets and, 
and I can tell y'all a trick about that too. Um, but, uh, as a breeder on this scale, now I realize that like, it's, it's a necessity, you know, um, if you're doing it with just a really small group and you're able to really stay on top of them. And whenever a female isn't taking whatever you're offering her, be able to offer her crickets instead, um, and willing to offer her crickets instead, that that's one thing, but to have a bunch of them, it, it's, it's easier to not stress about who's on crickets and who's not, and just feed everybody crickets. And then I also feed the ones that do eat Nubia, which is the majority of my, even my adult females, I also feed them Nubia as well, especially during their season. So they're getting a variety of stuff. Right. And same thing with the ones that eat worms. I have a W on a couple of even adult tubs, and every now and then I'll throw them a, 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 you know, a bowl of worms um, just to give them as much variety as possible. Um, yeah. But, yeah, crickets is a big thing. Um, the care... Like I said earlier, as far as keeping them, if you if you just have leopard geckos for pets and you're really interested in fat tails, don't hesitate at all. Especially if you're at least open-minded to using crickets because they aren't that much harder. The main differences with them is you don't have as big of a temperature range. So like Leos, you can keep those things at 80 degrees and they're going to be okay. You know, that's not right. that's not what we preach for a hot spot, but some people keep them at 83, 84, 85 ambient temps even with no hot spot. You know, and they and they thrive just fine as long as they're supplemented right and and you know, fed properly. But fat tails have a much smaller window. They need ninety degrees. If you have them below ninety degrees, they will stop eating. Period. So, I target about ninety two, and like ninety to ninety five is what I shoot for in my range on my racks. And so I just keep all my leos there too. My leos just stay a little bit hotter than than they really absolutely need. You know, um, that way it's it's all the same. Um, and nice. other than that, they just need to be hydrated a little bit more. So as long as you're not, like I said, as long as you're not neglecting your animals, it's not an issue. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. it, like honestly, take care of your animals. Honestly, don't have an issue. honestly, take care of your animals. And it's not an issue. Um, if you if you yeah. water your animals every five days, you're not going to have an issue. Three days is obviously much more optimal. After water sitting for seventy two hours, it's considered stagnant. But let's be real, very few people change water out every three days on their reptiles, except for like I said, those. Those people that have just a couple of pets that are able to devote that much time and daily attention to just a few pets. Um, but, right. you know, how many breeders change their water out every three days? Very few. But fat yeah. tails need fresh water. So if you're not cleaning every five days or so, you at least need to be changing waters out every five days or so. Because that water, just because you put a big tall bowl in there and it's only, you know, she's still got an inch left of it. She ain't drinking that. You know, that's been sitting yeah. there for five, for four days, five days. Bacteria. And Bacteria, all, of, all kind yeah. of nonsense. Cricket done went in there and laid eggs or whatever. Like, I've seen I've seen videos and pictures of people post stuff, and I'm just like, I can't believe the conditions that some people keep their animals in. Uh, it's just, it's... Yeah. But, and not to get off on a rant there. Um, yeah, fresh water. And more, I keep a humid hide in every single enclosure anyway. All of my leopard geckos, okay. even my males. Um, and so with my fat tails, I just keep a wetter humid hide. So their, their humid hide is instead of just damp, it's wet. It's not like swampy and dripping wet, but it's, it's pretty wet. And so you use cocoa for your, yeah, humid hides? I use a mixture of uh 50, 50 cocoa fiber and a uh, jungle mix by Zilla. And okay. the reason yeah. I use the jung jungle mix is because it has peat moss in it, which helps inhibit mold and bacterial growth. And then the only reason I add the cocoa fiber is just to cut costs because the cocoa is much cheaper than the jungle mix. Um, but you could use just... And it probably holds humidity a little bit better, too. It does. It does. It's it's more aerated. It has a lot of, like, wood chips and stuff in it. And so it it keeps it keeps you from dry packing as easily. Um, and I'm sure I know you... I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. If you use just straight cocoa right. fiber yeah. and you let it dry out too much, it's it's a pain in the butt to get it rehydrated. Um, so yeah. that, that jungle mix helps aerate a little bit more. And that peat moss in there, I, I don't have to change out my humidized containers, you know, substrate very often. I can do it pretty much on an as-needed basis. Um... Now, I will say another thing about the fat tails. Probably, in my opinion, probably the biggest uh, con of keeping them, if you want to do pros and cons, or, or breeding yeah. them, I'm sorry, of breeding them, breeding, is okay. my females, and I'm pretty sure it's all females, because it's like 90% of my females, once they start laying eggs for the season, they are going to poop in their humid hide. <laughs> every time. Every really? time. Every time they poop. That is their new poop oh, spot. Man. They can't control it. I don't know <laughs> just... what it is. I don't know what it is. After oh, they man. lay their first clutch of the season, 
they decide that they i i feel like it's some kind of either my theory is maybe in the wild it attracts cleanup crew which will take care of the eggs that aren't good but leave the good eggs alone that's okay. that's one theory i have others yeah. have told me a theory that they have of maybe it deters predators from digging up the eggs i don't know but okay. it's definitely a thing without a doubt um and wow. So it's just something you got to deal with. Uh, I just I go through my I go through my laying females a couple times a week and just clean out their humid hide, you know, their messes in their humid hide, and then they get changed out about once a you know every couple of weeks they get the whole substrate changed out um, on the ones that are okay. laying, and then and then my trick to get them to stop doing it once they're done with their season is I pull their humid hide for a week or two and just miss their cage a little bit during that period, and they have to pick a new poop spot, and then about yeah probably about fifty percent of them. We'll stick to that new poop spot when I put their humid hide back. But some of them, some of my fat tails, just a hundred percent all year, they just poop their humid hide. So those, those That's don't crazy. get, they they just get paper towels in their humid hide when they're not in season. And so that way I can keep them wow. a hydrated box, but it's not, you know, wasting all that all that substrate. And it's wow. not getting it's easier to, it's easier to clean with it when it's just paper towels, you know. Um, yeah. Going in there looking for eggs and you end up finding poop. <laughs> oh yeah, all the time. Non kind of gift they're leaving you. Oh, Nonstop. Man. Oh, I also wow. want. I also want to mention the trick about getting a fat tail if you want to try to transition one that is on crickets. That say you get one from a breeder that's on crickets okay. and you want to at least try to give it a more varied diet. The thing about it, if a cra if a fat tail or any animal has been on crickets all its life, it's likely never experienced eating out of a food dish. Is my observation. So what I do is I teach them how to be eat, eat out of a food dish by delegging crickets. I don't know if you, you know, you just pinch them on their, yeah. on their knees and the legs just pop off without pulling all their guts out. Sorry for being so morbid, but, um, put a bunch of deleg crickets in an escape proof feeder dish on a, on a fat tail that is used to eating crickets and it'll teach them to eat out of the dish on a feeder that they're already used to. And then once they're eating a couple of meals like that, then I'll add like, I'll put like half dubia roaches and half crickets and the dubia roaches I'll use aren't as, aren't as big as that gecko could necessarily handle. They're like cricket sized dubia, you know, like mediums. And once I see that they've consumed a couple of dubia, then I'll try dubia only. And usually, and by usually, I mean like I've had probably a 90% success rate with that method. If, um, I, they'll, the, it'll work. They'll take it. And then you're able to nice. feed them and then you're able to feed them both. You're able to feed them crickets and dubia if you want. Um, now getting right. them on getting them on mealworms, I can't I can't help you there. Worms is really tough. <laughs> like, Still working on that. Yeah, we we can get on the, we can get the babies on worms a lot of times, but like I said, once they get to a certain age, they just lose interest in that. They just don't move enough, I think. Um, now super worms, not even supers. Well, have that's what, that? that's one thing I was about to say. I don't I don't okay. I don't like using supers. They just I I prefer messing with mealworms. I breed my own mealworms and. Um, I have found that even geckos that will not touch a mealworm, some of them are more, more fat tails will eat supers than they will eat meals as far as adult okay. fat tails. So yeah, that's one thing that, you, that a lot of people can definitely go to if they're, you know, if they're having trouble with a female that's not eating that well during her, during her lay season, give her some superworms. That's a good high fat treat that, that will help her. And, um, most of them will accept it. Sometimes you might have to smash the head and give them a little juice to, you know, lick. But for some reason that they, they obviously taste different than the mealworms because some fat tail, some of my fat tails will go crazy for supers that won't ever touch a mealworm. It's, it's really weird. Yeah. I don't know. Is it, do you think it's the movement or no, because, because for nutritional content, no, or? because I can take, I can cut a super in half and I can cut a mealworm in half and offer them a, a, super that's barely moving you know just like nerves moving and it's the t like they they have to smell or taste differently because they're just all about it the ones that will eat it's it. super weird it is it really is i never yeah i never thought them to be that much different of a i mean obviously they're different species but like they're pretty similar yeah in, in most senses but they right they apparently have you a think. completely different flavor profile because that that <laughs> or, or so says my fat tails yeah Got to get them out of Africa and put them in the Middle East. <laughs> get them hanging out with some leopard geckos or something. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. That's crazy. Yeah. You never think like, I don't know, when it just comes to AFTs, you see like 
just a totally different atmosphere when it comes to like people in Leos and people in AFTs. So I was going to ask you that, like, do you see, um, when it comes to like just the atmosphere of people breeding or types of people who are kind of more in the AFTs compared to Leos, do you see a difference in that or like the hobby when it comes to, you know, comparing those two together? Well, um, I think, like I said earlier with it, with them requiring more care more love and attention to breed i think that aspect weeds a certain type of people out in the you know from the beginning um so yeah there is a little bit different atmosphere there is a little bit less nonsense there's a little bit more like respect i think um like across the board just in the sense that in the Leo world, I mean, there's just always so much freaking drama. You know, there's always, right, always some somebody that just got in, you know, a year or two and, and think they really know their shit and, you know, start trying to talk down to, to people that are more respected in the community. You don't get as much of that in the fat tail world because it's, it's just less. I think people come into it with a lot more open mind um, in most cases. Or like I said, if they don't, their collection weeds them out pretty quickly on its own. You know what I mean? Right. Faster than, you know, with Leo's where we talked about that. You could don't even have to keep them to the most optimal care and they'll still survive. Even breed. Sometimes you'll get eggs from Leo's that aren't doing so well. So absolutely. Yeah. Leopard yeah. geckos are, are obvious. I mean, everybody knows they're one of the easiest things to, to reproduce as far as the reptile world goes. Um, and fat, right. and, and I don't mean to scare anybody on the fat tails. They're really not that much harder. They're just require more care and they're not as prolific. Like even when you get yeah. eggs, sometimes the pairings don't take or you'll have what looks like a fertile egg and they don't go full term or, you know, they're just, and you can talk to anybody, any fat tail breeder will probably tell you the same thing unless they've got something figured out that I haven't. I'm, I'm planning on tweaking my incubation methods a little bit more next year and going with an even higher temp with my tip sex females. Cause I feel like, just like they have a smaller range to exist, I feel like their eggs have a much smaller range to incubate. Uh, for example, I, I was incubating at like 89 and a half temp sex males, and I wasn't getting any males. Like, none. Mm -hmm. Maybe one or two here and there. Interesting. I think I was above the spectrum, and I was getting all females. Now, they're not hot females, because I bred some of those females that I, that I produced at those, at those temperatures. But, you know, just like with the Leos, once you get above a certain temperature it flips back to the other sex i think that's what i was experiencing there so i've dropped my tip sex males down to about 88 now which still produces pretty much 100 percent temp sex males on leos too so that's fine but then on the female side you know a lot of people incubate all the way down to like 80 degrees for leos for temp sex females yeah that's lethal for a fat tail uh, I, in my opinion i i some people may have success with it elsewhere i have not had success with that low attempts on my tip sex females. I've had to be 82, 82 and a half, 83 even. This year I'm actually sitting at 84. And I'm thinking about even cranking okay. that up. I'm thinking about cranking that up at one more notch. I built another incubator this year. So next next season I'm gonna have a Leo dedicated incubator. And then my two fat my two incubators that I've been sharing this year are gonna be dedicated to the fat tails. So I can have three or four different temp zones basically actually. Um, cause I've got wow. these two and then my new one that I built is actually a split. I, I use wine coolers to build mine. Um, okay. I'll, which I love and highly recommend. They're the best insulation and you can see through the door. So you don't have to open it a hundred times a day when you're, when you're excited about a collection that's about to hatch. Um, right. it, it's definitely, definitely the best, in my opinion, the best way to go. Um, I pick them up anytime I see them and, and rebuild them and sell them at the expos and stuff and keep the ones that I really like. Okay. So. Nice. Yeah. With AFTs, it seems like there's a lot different atmosphere when it just comes to getting into the attention that it takes to just breed and just be aware of what it means to breed AFTs. It seems like, you know, you're always tweaking things and trying to get better with breeding or even like when it comes to, we talked about incubation and feeding and that sort of thing, but it just seems like it takes so much more kind of of a, I don't know, careful eye, I guess you could call it of, you know, paying attention to breeding, which, you know, some people just put a Leo, a male and female in, and then they leave it on the, you know, the incubator rack for a little bit. And then they hatch out, um, they breed it at like 84 and then that's it. Where, where it seems African fat tails, it's really a very detailed, um, you know, attention 
based process that you have to do, um, you know, comparing it to Leo's. Well, like I said, I think, I think that's a big part of why there's obviously not as many people working with them because it's, it's just not something you can take lightly, um, or as lightly, uh, it's, uh, uh, I was gonna say I had something on, my, on the tip of my tongue. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. No, it's uh, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's definitely something you you have to at least at least give give the right attention to for sure. I can't stress right. I can't stress that enough. It, it, you, you like I said, your animals will tell you real quick. It, I've I've seen plenty of people that that just weren't giving them enough hydration or you know not feed them often enough or not feeding them the right things. And it, you, you can tell it real quick with fat tails for sure. Sweet. Now for any advice that you'd give for people wanting to get into fat tails or wanting to learn, you know, genetics, um, getting into breeding, what would you recommend for someone who's just getting into it? Maybe they're in Leo's now and they're like, okay, let me do some more research into this. How should I go about doing that? Well, actually, I just remembered what was on the tip of my tongue. That's the other thing. I feel like okay. there's a different a different approach to it because there's a lot less researchable information out there on fat tails than there is on leopard geckos. You know, if you want to really? get into it, well, I mean, just think about it. If you want to get into reading leopard geckos, you can go listen to all your podcasts. You can go listen to all the Gecko Nation radio podcasts. And in a matter of a couple of weeks of listening to everything a couple of times, you can damn near be a pro. If you can retain the right. information right, obviously, you, <laughs> yeah. obviously yeah. you still got to go through the motions and do the learning process, you know, in physicality form. But how many, how many episodes like this are there out there about, you know, how to the little tweaks that there are on fat tails or how many articles are there out there? It's just not that much. So I think that that's a, that plays a big right. factor in, in, you know, just the lack of resources out there for them specifically for them. Um, okay. Because it's not the same. It's really not the same. Um, so uh, that's another reason I wanted to do this episode, to try to, you know, help other keepers and new breeders try to have a little bit better success with them. Um, uh, as far as, like, where to find, like, morph information, um, the best resource I can say is a friend of mine, Danielle, her her geckoholic is uh, her, her business name. Um, and she's got a really good write up on all the different morphs she's got all the morphs laid out and and what's what and um exactly what's who you know what morphs are what um and w okay. what's recessive and what's dominant and you know all this all the specifics of everything um other than that there's not a whole lot out there evan to be honest um Okay. Sounds like you need to start an AFT podcast. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's there's a couple of groups out there that are pretty good and, and informative, and, and all of us are pretty active in them. Um, so it, it's it's really just one of those things that, like I said, there's still so much to be learned and so much to be to be put out there, you know. Um, so right, that's where we're at right now. And when it comes to like misinformation, then I think we see that a lot, even with the resources. Um, in the leopard gecko hobby, you still see so many people who get into this with so much misinformation just because people in groups are spreading misinformation or there's misinformation in articles online and so many other things where people are getting information incorrect where there's so many great resources that we could find if you wanted to go back and listen to something or see how a morph worked or whatever it may be. There's great people in the hobby could help you out with that. But with AFTs, do you still see that same miscommunication where a lot of people are still getting information incorrect or still things because they're harder to keep? Yeah, here and there. Um, I mean, just the other day, there was somebody arguing with, with a very knowledgeable breeder about about a very simple aspect, you know, just aberrancy and, and how it plays or or being able to see a hat, you know, in a, in a non-visual, um, things like that, that, that some people you know, get wrong or, or misinformed on or, um, but it, again, it's, it's a pretty close knit community at this point. It's expanding by the day, but, uh, the, the corrections are, corrections are taken for the most part the right way. You know, whenever, whenever somebody's putting the wrong information out there, usually whenever they're, it, I, and I guess that's what I was getting at earlier. Like, it seems like you don't have quite as many people that are just diving into it without any 
any uh, insight at all. Um, they're they're at least asking questions and and generally curious about it. Um, and then you get plenty of the newbies that that definitely aren't doing their due, due diligence and homework and you know just going on there asking stupid questions and that's aggravating just like in any in any species. Um, but you know we all start somewhere, so you gotta take the good with the bad and and give at least. You give everyone at least a shred of patience. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they deserve <laughs> right. a little, a little more, or a little less. But um, yeah, we all start somewhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah, and there's amazing people like you doing this, and out there putting their name out there, and telling people what's right from wrong, and showing people, you know, by example, what to do. Especially with what we talked about today, and you definitely did your due diligence and, you know, you put yourself on the line. And I know when we called, we were, you know, talking about this, you're like, man, I'm so nervous to see what people are going to say, but tons of people know you and you have your reputation out there that's spotless and continuing to keep it that way. So a lot of um, thumbs up to you, man, for all the great work you're doing. Thank you, Evan. And again, I can't thank you enough for, for letting me come and, and do a little impromptu episode and, and get this out there in the, you know, I want to be able to have it on on it, not only as many platforms as possible to get as many people aware of it, but I also wanted to be able to explain it a little more thoroughly than I could. As as thorough as I wrote that out, it's still not the same as being able to explain it and then you know emphasize certain things, um, such as you know the, the it's not all whiteouts. It's a very 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 isolated case that we can figure out right now and. And, and right. information is going to continue coming out, I'm sure, especially now that this is out. I've already had several people reach out to me and some of them were legitimate and some of them are, you know, not really looking at much, you know, maybe just a missed aim or something and thinking it might be, the, you know, and I'm going to get a lot of that probably false, false identifications on that, stuff like that. But um, again, I felt like it's something that I've, I've to me it, it's just something that needs at least the attention of the community we don't need to be scared about it we don't need to i, I certainly 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 don't want to see us like fearful of the whiteout gene like you know like like a lot of people are of lemon frost or enigma or you know stuff like that uh because i i th again there's hundreds and thousands of of whiteouts out there that have no issues at all that are perfect animals um, so I think it's pretty isolated and, and I guess we'll learn more, you know, hopefully more people come out of the woodwork or, or hopefully not, you know, um, hopefully we don't hear from too many people that they, that they have the same issue and, and we can, we can move along, you know, move on with, with the viable lines that are producing perfectly healthy animals that don't have any issues. Um, you know, that's, that's yeah. my, that's my plan here. I've still got. I've got, like I said, I've got white out in almost everything except my caramel Zulus or my Zulus. Um, and all of those other white outs are completely, you know, have no ties to, to what I'm dealing with here. Um, so, you know, I'm fortunate in that aspect that I can still work with the gene and not have to, you know, reinvest a whole lot of brand new money, in, you know, to other breeders for, to, to acquire different lines. I already had several lines here to work with. So, I'm definitely count my blessings there. Um, but yeah, again, I just feel like it was something that needed the attention of the community. And I think we just need to have our eyes open um, and, and not, not stay quiet about something. If we, if we see something, you know? Uh, so again, thanks, right. thanks for having me on to, to take care of that. Evan. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah. And like you said, even with the other stock that you're working with, it might not be as nice, but you're, you're not going anywhere. So you have nothing but time. <laughs> That's the plan, man. That's the plan. Awesome. So, Seth, I appreciate you for coming on to the podcast. Glad you reached out to me. Um, for anybody who wants to go and has any questions, they want to reach out to you, maybe talk about this issue uh, more in depth or just have any questions about AFTs, Leos, whatever, how could they go out and um, reach out to you? Yeah, uh, my my Facebook uh, page Huff's Herps, uh, Instagram Huff's Herps, uh, and or if you want to email it, Huff's Herps at yahoo.com, uh, H U F F S H E R P S at Yahoo. Uh, that's probably the three best ways to get a hold of me. I'm pretty active or try to be fairly active on my social media. Um, kind of been slacking on my game lately, but like I said, I've been stressed out to the max, but <laughs> uh, I'm gonna get back on that soon and and uh, start posting more pics of these awesome geckos we got growing out over here. 
Sweet. Well, Seth, again, I appreciate you for coming on. You're definitely going to be regular guest on the podcast, continuing to come on as long as we do this thing, man. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep up the good work, and we'll have you on very soon. <laughs> Thanks again, Evan. Good talk, man. Awesome. Have a good one. All right, there. And that's going to wrap us up for this episode of the podcast. I just really want to thank Seth for trusting me with this episode. He came to me and really just called me up and wanted to iron out the details of what he talked about today. Talked about AFTs, of course, which is an episode that is long overdue. So I really appreciate Seth for coming onto the podcast and just being really honest, which is part of my one big thing today is really Seth's honesty and his dedication to the hobby and really what it means to be a breeder who is honest and really just upholds himself to the highest standards and really just puts himself out there in a really brave and courageous manner to go out and put his reputation a little bit on the line uh, for what it means to be a really great and honest breeder. So I want to again thank Seth for coming onto the podcast and trusting me with this episode. And another thing that Seth called me up after he recorded the episode and he wanted to mention was a really good trick with AFTs. So as we mentioned in the podcast, a lot of AFTs are cricket eaters. So one thing that Seth did mention and hopefully I don't mess this up, Seth. So he's going to have to come back on and explain what he exactly said without me butchering this. But he basically said that when you're feeding and cleaning AFTs, one trick that he really found that was really helpful was to feed them first when you're feeding crickets before you clean and then come back after essentially. So whatever crickets that they don't eat or when they make a mess, you're able to go ahead and clean after they make the mess and poop and mess up their whole enclosure after they go to feed. So that's a great tip that Seth also wanted me to share with you guys. So I hope you guys enjoy that tip. Last announcement before we end off with the podcast today, the Reptile Super Show is coming up. I hope you guys in Southern California and really pretty much anywhere, if you really want to just take a short vacation, fly in for a super great, awesome, huge reptile show with over 400 booths. It's really just going to be really super amazing. So if you're able to come out, please come out to the Reptile Super Show. Strength and Leos will be there. Decked Out Geckos will be there. I will, of course, be there. So if you listen to the podcast, just want to hang out, talk, please make sure to come up to the booth, say hi, introduce yourself. I'd really love to come out and meet you. That will be um, at the Anaheim Convention Center, September 11th and 12th. So again, Reptile Super Show, make sure to be there. Mm -hmm.